Uh, I'm just going to jump in with the presentation. Uh, we have not that many slides. Uh, just going to burn through a few slides and then the entire spend the rest of our available time on demos. All right. So um, we're talking about creating REST and GraphQL database endpoints with Data API Builder. This is something new, something actually that's still in preview. Um, that we're going to talk about and examine. Uh, Mark did a wonderful job with my introduction, so I'm not going to spend any time uh, talking about myself. I'll say there's a bit of an update there. Uh, Talon has been acquired by Ernst & Young, so I'm now a Microsoft consultant with Ernst & Young as well. 12-year MVP, lots of Pluralsight courses, lots of speaking and writing, um, but that's more than enough about me. Here, here's a link that you can visit. It's a bit.ly link that will take you to my OneDrive. And from there, you can download a zip file containing the code for tonight's presentation, as well as this deck. So that's bit.ly Bay Area 2023 underscore DAB. D-A-B stands for Data API Builder, which is what we're talking about tonight. So are we good on audio and video there, Mark? Uh, we we are excellent so let's start what is data api builder guess what it's it's just what it sounds like <laughs> it you can build an api right over your database uh, with this with this uh, uh, technology uh, you can expose any kind of database operations that you want and uh, they will be exposed as endpoints, exposed either via REST or GraphQL. Now, mo most of us are familiar with REST. Perhaps fewer of us are familiar with the GraphQL. You'll get the flavor for both. Uh, this thing is cross-platform and open source, so it's not just Windows, but Linux, Mac OS, et cetera. There's the GitHub link, and uh, it is uh, still, as I mentioned, in preview, and is in public preview. It is not fully baked. Some things may change. Some things are still missing, but uh, we're getting close. Um, and it supports our traditional relational SQL databases, uh, but be they on-prem or in the cloud on Azure, and that would be exposing tables, views, stored procedures uh, out of either Azure SQL, SQL Server on-prem, or Postgres SQL or MySQL. And beyond that, in the non-relational NoSQL space, a JSON documents with Azure Cosmos DB. Security is fully supported. We have authentication, Auth2, uh, JWT tokens, easy authentication, authorization. We'll see demos using role-based authentication, um, using JWT, as well as item-level security, using policy expressions. Uh, to control, you know, how much or how little we expose out of our database through our API. All right, uh, how do you get started? It's really easy. Uh, you, most of us have .NET 6 already. We're on 7, 8 is coming. But just to make sure, list the SDKs. If you don't have it, hit this link and you'll be able to download and install .NET 6. Here you can see I've got .NET 6 and .NET 7 installed. Um, and then install the CLI, the Data API Builder CLI, with this .NET tool install command. And um, is this showing version 0 0.6? So we're still in preview with that as a zero. Uh, currently, actually, we're on .7, and uh, hopefully, we'll see general availability in the near future. I've got only a couple of more slides here just to give you the, the, the basic idea here that the CLI uh, allows you to manage a configuration file. It'll initialize it and then update it and uh, allow you to manage it, uh, uh, which of course is just a JSON file that you can edit by hand. You'll see both. You'll run a dab init to create that configuration file. Then you will list your entities one at a time, every table, view, or store procedure that you want to expose. You'll call dab add. You need to make a change in permissions or security or you know update an existing item it would be a dab update and when you're ready to start that runtime engine and just host your api just hit dab start and you're off to go you're off to the races here is a bare bones dab configuration file um 
this is what gets created when you initialize the configuration file, and it doesn't really do anything because it's bare bones. All it does is point to a data source. In this particular case, it's a Microsoft SQL Server backend database with a connection string pointing to a database on SQL Server. There are runtime settings that allow you to control whether it's exposed via REST or GraphQL or both, and by default is both, as you can see, through the slash API or the slash Graph, GraphQL endpoint. And, you know, um, whether you're in develop, development or prod, cores, very important to restrict, you know, cross origin scripting, to restrict allowed clients, as well as authentication that we're going to be looking at later. And the third part are the entities, which is empty now, so we're not exposing anything. But this entities property here is where you will start plugging in your tables, views, store, and store procedures that you wish to expose uh, via REST and or GraphQL. These are the supported data sources. I mentioned them already. Postgres, MySQL, etc. cetera. Uh, REST, GraphQL, these are the main sections of the, of the configuration file that we just reviewed. For each entity, so you'll have an entity name, that's the name that's exposed by the API, and then there'll be a source, that's the physical name of the table viewer sprock that you are exposing. REST and GraphQL control at, at the entity level as well, as well as permissions, right? And that's it, I have no more slides, isn't that great? No more slides. Okay, so we can get rid of PowerPoint, and we can just jump into our demo. I will pause and see if there's any questions uh, at this point um, that anyone might have uh, over my introduction. Otherwise, I will just jump right in. Okay, silence I, is. I haven't, I haven't seen any questions posted yet. I'm watching. All right, silence is compliance. Let's just jump right in. So uh, we're going to start off uh, here in Visual Studio. You can see. I've got um, this massive solution here. This is my workshop solution, and we're just focused on the data API builder. And um, you can actually, let me switch over to the uh, folder view here in data API builder. I've got two folders, one for Cosmos DB and one for SQL Server. We're gonna start with SQL Server. Everyone's familiar familiar ground and then we'll see how the time goes uh, yeah, i don't know I've, I, this is my first time i'm doing this presentation i'm not sure on timings and we'll see how much time if any we'll get to spend on cosmos db uh but let's start with familiar ground sql server right and i've got a bunch of script files here and i've got a uh a set of commands here which i've got open already and the first thing i'm going to do is run this sql file to create our database um, Go ahead and create the database. And all I've done here is create a very simple database called library. Um, this just generates random numbers. This just generates some random text. The real meat of the store of, of the database is that there is a book table and an author table. And um, the book table uh, just, list, just has information about books. The author table has detailed information about each author, including a lengthy bio. And there is a book author table with a foreign key to both tables defining our many to many. And then I'm populating a bunch of books. And I'm independently populating a bunch of authors. And then I'm defining the many to many relationships by populating the junction table so that one book can be associated with multiple authors and one author can be associated with multiple books. Very, very basic. So we've run that and we've populated our database. And I'm going to um, show you that now that I've got this uh, temp folder here, and I've got two folders, one for Cosmos, one for SQL. Let's go to the SQL folder, and it's empty at this time. And what I'm going to do is run this dab init command. And if you look at this command, you can see I'm initializing a, uh, a new configuration file for Microsoft SQL Server with this connection string in development mode. And that has created 
a new file called dabconfig.json. Let's open that up in Visual Studio and have a quick look at it. It'll look very much like the bare bones template we saw on the slides because we have, haven't set our entities yet. There's our data source, rest in GraphQL runtime with cores and authentication, and no entities yet. Okay, uh, so we're not going to get very far without defining any entities. So the next command that we're going to run are going to define entities for those two tables. There's the book table and the author table. So this is dab add, add an entity called book. That's how it's going to be exposed to the API. The source is dbo.book, that's like the physical table name, and the permissions are anonymous colon start, meaning no permissions are required to do everything. <laughs> so uh, wide open um, to, to the world. And uh, there's another identical command for the author entity that will expose against the author table. Now we haven't defined the relationships between them. So GraphQL, we'll talk more about GraphQL in a moment, won't be able to do what it's really designed to do, which is like compose these graphs until we shortly add app that relationship. But for now, just having a look at the configuration file, we can see that entities has been populated with our book and author entities pointing to the underlying physical table and uh, permissions that we defined on it with the CLI. All right, now we have something that we can start with, so we have something we can work with. Uh, okay, and therefore the next command would be what? Dab start. And with our fingers crossed, it starts up. We're listening on localhost 5000 slash API or slash GraphQL, depending on whether we want REST or GraphQL. So why don't I go ahead and open my browser? Please uh, open my browser. Oh, no, that's fine. Uh, and uh, head on over to localhost. What was it? Localhost 5000. Actually, uh, let me just copy this, this link, right? Right, slash API and the name of my entity slash book. Yeah, there's my data, right? It's not easy to read. So uh, we'll deal with that in a moment, but there it is exposed um, as a uh, as a REST endpoint where I just hit with my browser anonymously and got and got all, a list of all my books, right? So that's that's pretty cool. I mean, I think that's kind of impressive right off the bat, right? Like to just kind of get that without really doing anything other than exposing the table. Um, what about that GraphQL endpoint? Um, let's actually, it looks like I'm seeing an error here in the. Uh, hopefully that's nothing to worry about. So here's the GraphQL endpoint. And this opens up in a, in a, um, in a kind of like swagger like UI for GraphQL. So for those of you not familiar with GraphQL, REST is very primitive. It has the, the primitives, get, put, post, delete, etc. For the where where the verb, the HTT verb is very closely associated with the operation and, and it's very resource oriented, it's very resource based. GraphQL is more of a command kind of uh, structured schema oriented uh, um, API where you can see uh, that I've got um, under types, uh, uh, under query, uh, you can see that it is detected because I have a book and an author table. It has created a books and a book by PK to get a single book by primary key or to get um, all the books. Same thing with authors, right? Um, and but in, in, in either case, it's going to be easier to work with. It's going to be easier to work with Postman. So here I've got my Postman collection all set up. I'm going to go with the querying tables. Start with just querying tables. We've got REST and GraphQL. Let's let's look at getting all books. And here are all my books. It's a lot easier to read. We can see all the books just by hitting a slash API slash book with a get. Get all authors, same thing, slash API slash author. Gets all the authors, right? Full, all the fields. So we'll be able to narrow down if we don't need everything. But, you know, by default, when we hit this endpoint, we get all the authors, unfiltered, all call, all, all properties. We want to get a book by ID, by rest nomenclature, we would just tack on the slash primary key value from book ID 2017. 
And then if you've ever done anything with OData, you're, fam you're familiar with this, with the uh, query URI syntax for order by and select. So here I'm saying order by pages ascending and title uh, ascending. So we have a few books that have no pages. Where pages is null, you can see they're sorted alphabetically by title. And then we continue sorting up, um, by pages ascending. All right. Um, and if I only want the title property, I don't need every property of the entity. Then it's a dollar sign select that gets tacked on to the URI. Now, I only ask for title. I'm getting back title, a book ID, and pages. That's because you'll always get back what you select plus whatever you order by. And you'll always get back the primary key, which is book ID. And I'm ordering by pages and title, so pages is included as well. And that's why we're getting that output. Here, I'm just ordering by title and selecting the title, but I'm still getting the book ID because you always get the primary key. Like you can't exclude the primary key, but I just want the title otherwise and no other properties. And that's how you do that. Um, and complex expressions like, you know, pages greater. Um, oh, actually, that's the next one. So this is just another example of just giving me those where pages are greater than five, you know, more than 500 ordered by pages where I'm just selecting the title, but I'm seeing the book ID and pages because I'm filtering uh, on pages and the book ID is the primary key. Here's the complex expression. So I've got, you know, year greater than or equal to 1970 or the title is foundation in parentheses and pages greater than 250. So all the pages are going to have to be greater than 250. Uh, and, and the year is going to be greater than 1970, except for the one book here, somewhere in here, that I pass it. Here it is, Foundation. The book Foundation, year 1951 is before 1970 because the title is Foundation. Otherwise, all the other books um, have at least 250 pages. Okay. Um, Pagination, fully supported. I just say I want the first 10. I'll get back the first 10. And at the bottom, I'll get back a next link, which has a continuation token embedded in it that will give me the next 10. And at the bottom of that, and there's 21. So there's going to be one more page that has just one book in it. That's the next link. And there it is. That's the la our last book. So we just page through 10 at a time. So now let's have a look at GraphQL. Now you'll notice in all of these cases, I either got books or authors, but I didn't get any kind of like graph. You know, um, there were, there's no joining on the parent to child, or in this case, a many to many, um, in order to get related information. That's where the power of GraphQL comes in. So with REST, these are all gets because we're retrieving information, and we would use other verbs like post and put, as you'll see soon, for, for update and delete. But with GraphQL, everything's a post. Even the gets are posts, if you will, right? Because you are essentially always posting a request to get or, or mutate, which is the word that GraphQL uses for modifying data, updating, deleting, um, or inserting new data. So with a query uh, means we want the book's entity and we uh, um, we want these particular, particular properties. We have to list them out. We post that and we get back our response. These are all our books. Uh, what about authors? Same thing. Right. I'm list. I'm listing everything. If I don't want everything, I just exclude. It. I'm getting the bio, which is length, which is verbose. But that's only because I've specified to include it. Otherwise, I wouldn't get it. Right. Just ask for what you want. Ask for what you need. Remember that by PK function that we saw uh, in, in in the browser before that that GraphQL kind of that that uh, GraphQL provides for you to get a single entity by its ID. That's retrieving this one book by ID. This is retrieving a book by title where I'm just using the filter to say title equal foundation to get that one book or multiple books by that name if there were. Get all books sorted by pages. Here's an order by embedded in the book's entity. And these are the columns I want returned again or the properties I want returned again. And you see it's sorted by pages and uh, got the few pages that are null are sorted ascending by title, just as we specified in our in our um, request. Pagination works a little differently than it does for rest. You have to say that you only want the top 10. 
for the first page, you say after equal null, and you say, I want to know if there's going the next page, and I want to know what the cursor is for the next page, and you will get that back. You'll just get the first 10, and at the bottom, you'll get you'll be able to see, yes, there's another page, and you'll get an end cursor with a, a continuation token in it, which you can then copy and paste into the after value and reissue the request to get the next page of 10. I mean, you know, there's 21 of them, so at the bottom here, we expect this to be true, and this should get us, give us the next and last page with the 21st item in it. I'll just paste that into the request body. And yeah, has next page is false. Interesting, right, this is the 21st book. Interesting that we get a continuation token anyway, but it's useless. Has next page is false, there are no more. If you paste it in, if because you, you're curious, like I am, and curiosity doesn't kill the cat, you'll see that all it does is return nothing because we've, we, we've retrieved all the entire results set. Get all books with authors. So here I'm leveraging the power of GraphQL to say, I want books and I want, these are the properties of the books that I want, but guess what? There's a relationship on author. So I want all the related authors. I want all, all the authors of the book and these are the properties that I want. I don't need the full bio. I just want this information. Run this. And you might have expected it to fail because I mentioned already that I haven't yet added the entities. We haven't defined an author's entity on books that is the relationship, right? We haven't defined it in our DAB configuration file. So let me go ahead and do that. Um, I have to stop the server. And it's a it's a many to many relationship, so you know going in both directions. So this is the first one. I'm updating the book entity. This is a DAB update, and I'm adding a relationship called authors. The cardinality is many, targeting author, and the linking object is dbo.bookauthor. That's our many to many. And guess what? We'll need the same thing for author, which has a many to many to books. And if we look at the configuration file to see the effects of those changes. Here, these were just added by the CLI when I entered those commands, one on the book side and one on the author side going into books. Okay, so now that that's been done, I can restart the server and now that query should work just fine. And it does, look, books with an array of authors. Now, most books have only one author, but scrolling a bit further down, you'll see that we've got a book with a bunch of authors here. This book has two authors. And if you look at the back end, you'll see the select statement with the joins that was dynamically generated, kind of like in a link to entities fashion, to get the data as requested by the GraphQL query. And then it's many to many. I can go in the reverse direction. I can say I want a list of authors, and I actually just want uh, this one author. And I want all the information, including the verbose bio. And I want the books of that author, like just going in the other direction. And those books should be ordered by year ascending. This is all GraphQL syntax, nothing to do with Data API Builder. Data API Builder is just exposing a GraphQL endpoint to support these conventional GraphQL queries. So hit select and yeah, there's, there's uh, Isaac Asimov, his bio, and all the books that he's, uh, yeah, a lot of books. Very prolific writer, got a lot of books, this one, okay? All right, uh, let me see if I need to pause for any questions before moving on. There are no questions in, in chat. Uh, well, there is, there's one just added by David. Um, David asks, is there a way to define different key names in the request is, for the return JSON? I I'm sorry, is there request? a way to, to define what? Is there a way to define different key names in the request for the return JSON? The oh, I don't believe so. End cursor uh, returned as next page by example. Well, the first the first part of the question, which I got, I, you know, no, you're going to get, you know, the column names are going to be surfaced as camel case JSON property names. Thank you. Um, what was the second part of the question? Does IE request end cursor returned as next page by example? Oh, you know, you can't change the name of that. I mean, I get I get where this line of questioning might be going, like what if you have a property by that name? 
but um, think, mm -hmm. taking a closer look. Let me okay, and, and, and David, you're free to speak up if you want to clarify that at all. Yeah, sure. Um, so the pagination example. Right, so no, it's always going to be called next link, but it's outside of your data set. So, and you can't control these column names. Or really, all you can do is essentially alias the table name with whatever entity you want to expose on the UR on the URI. Okay. All right. So chugging your law then. Um, let's look at updating data. With the rest, like I said, it's going to be based on your verb. So if you want to create a book, it's going to be a post. And in the body, here's the body of my new book. I want to add a new book. And it has added the book. This is ID 1021. Didn't exist before. And notice the year is 2018. So if I want to update a book, I can do a put. And in the body, right? The, the primary key of the ID that I want to update is in the URI. And a put is a full update, meaning I have to provide the full entity. I just want to change the year from 2018 to 2019, but if I just provide the year, I will lose the date and I will use, the, I'm sorry, I will lose the title and the pages and just have the year. That's the behavior of put. However, patch does let you do just that. So patch lets me say, hey, I just want to change one property. I don't need to retrieve the entire entity and send back the entire entity. I'm of 1021. I just change that one property from 2019 to 2020. And you see what comes back. It's been updated to 2020 and we haven't lost the other properties. And let's now finally delete this new book that we just created, 1021, by using an HTTP delete verb. No, there's no body. It's just on the URI is the ID and it's been deleted. You see, we got a 204. No content return, 204 is success status. If I hit send again, now I'm getting a 404. It's not found because I just deleted it. GraphQL, remember everything's a post and there's no concept of, there's no distinction between patch and put. Everything's a patch. So here I'm gonna create a book by saying create book and here's my item. We'll add a new row to the table. ID is 1022. Now you can see it going up by one. Update the book. I just need to change the year from 2018 to 2019. This behaves like a patch. And this just says what I want returned back in the response. I might not re need anything returned back in the response, but I'm returning back, you know, everything. It's just to show that I, everything is still there. It's just the year that's been updated to 2019. Delete a book. Delete book. See, th these are all GraphQL mutations. Create, update, and delete. These are all graph QL mutations that where you just invoke the verb, you know, delete entity in this case, provide the uh, entity, and you'll get these are the properties you'll get back of the entity that you just deleted, right? This is the entity I just deleted. If I try to delete it again, interesting, I don't get back a 404. This is not REST, so you know, you can't expect those conventions to be adhered to. You get back a payload that just indicates, you know, delete book, no, like if, uh, that, that's your way of knowing it's like a 404. So, so up to this a, point, there's a question yeah. uh, posted by Colin in the chat. It's uh, his question is, what is the canonical use case for this technology? OK, <laughs> <laughs> so why? So it, it's perfect timing for the question. So let me just continue on and hopefully get the question answered. Anyone who knows me until now would think I do not like this technology because I, I don't believe tables should be exposed in general from a database. I am a, a strong believer in abstraction over tables, either through views or ideally through stored procedures, where the underlying structure of the tables, hence whether it's this data API client, while I chat about this, uh, or um, you know, or just a, a traditional middle tier um, when it has to hit the database, it should be calling stored procedures, and 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 because it is very rare that you would want to expose the raw underlying the raw underlying table. Invariably, you're going to need joins to to at least bring some logical view to the data beyond the raw 
you know, primary keys, you know, to join on foreign keys in order to bring in reference data to make the, the, the response, you know, more usable in that sense. Um, and to perhaps apply business logic in terms of you know, how you join and in store procedures, certainly you can apply all sorts of business logic without going overboard and without getting into the discussion of, you know, where does business logic belong and how much business logic goes into the data tier. Um, I always maintain that just by selecting appropriate data types for your tables, you are in some form implementing business logic by saying that this column is an int or a date and it, Cannot accept care, you know, text. So you're like validating data right there in the most primitive form. So, so, so it's a fuzzy line where where you where you draw the line uh, to to middle tier logic uh, in, implementing your business logic. But certainly, pr primitive forms of business logic um, should be and could be employed uh, in views and store procedures. And the data API builder can be made to expose only views and or only store procedures, and therefore um, broaden the canonical use for this technology as the question was put, um, if I understood the question correctly, because it seems to me like more a question of guidance, like is this even a good idea? Is this appropriate? So, you know, for uh, certainly for primitive data structures that live in tables, absolutely. This is this is like your your low barrier to entry. You're there in no time with an API that exposes your table data. And, and, and if that's what you need to do, whether it's read only or or, or CRUD operations, you know, there's, there's no reason why not. More elaborate systems like large scale applications, I would be less inclined to expose the tables, more inclined to expose views and or stored procedures. So that's our segue. That's our segue into the next step, which is views. So, um, Okay, and uh, yeah, next question. Couple of questions. Couple of questions yeah. here, uh, David. Again, if a put call is made and values are overridden that are not included, does that include primary keys, or are they left as is? Well, an update cannot modify the primary key. Okay. Value because it's uh, at least from a REST standpoint, it's part of the URI. It's not. It's right. You specify the ID in the URI and the body. Um, you specify the, the the primary key in the URI, and the body contains the updated entities, which cannot which cannot include uh, the the primary key. So it would have to be a delete and an insert if you needed to do that. Okay, I think that probably answers his question. And then uh, Nandan is asking: Is it possible to hook into business logic into business logic in managed code? Mm -hmm. That's a loaded question. I think the only the only real answer to that is with using SQL CLR, but that's not that's usually not a good idea. SQL CLR will run managed code. So if you know, I mean, now you're talking about baking all the business logic into your database by compiling C sharp assemblies, deploying the, those DLLs to your database, um, and then your store. Then you could expose store procedures that. Would could essentially be wrappers around your SQL CLR code written in C sharp. That's the only way that I could think of doing that. Um, although there is, there is, I mean, I can't say for sure, but keep your ears and eyes open for some technologies that might actually allow you to issue a, a web API calls from your store procedures. And, and that's all I'll say on that. So, yeah, there, there are. This is just a good thing to add to your toolbox, but there are all sorts of possibilities. Um, I'm just going to raise the level of abstraction from tables ever so slightly to using views. OK, I'm going to go back to Management Studio. And run this script here. Create views. It's just creating one view. You see, it's a very simple view, but it's got a CTE inside of it. I've got some string concatenation here already. I'm abstracting the details of the table away. And I am um, I'm joining on my CTE in order to construct through the use of the string ag function a, a comma-separated value list of authors for each book. 
right? So there's no table in the database that looks like this, but I've got a view that is materializing this results set, and, and I might want to hide the tables, but expose this view, right? So there's a bunch of authors on this uh, on this book, and you know that Isaac Asimov has written a lot of books, including this one co-written here. Uh, so that's kind of what I've done with this view, and, and this, is, this is the output of the view. And now what I'm going to do is stop DAB, and run this add command. Add an entity called book detail. The source of it is dbo.vw, because this is my physical view name in the database, but it's just going to be exposed as book detail through my API. But it's this view, vw book details. The source type is a view. You do have to provide the primary key column because that's not inferable from a view. And again, I'm exposing all permissions. And now I've got a view which uh, I can uh, start the API again, head back on over to Postman. Just a few queries here. This is book detail. You know, that's mapped to my view. Yeah, here's, here, here's the view, here are the view results, including the comma separated list of authors. Right. Uh, I can, Query the book by its ID using the primary key in the URI, 1017. I can use the, the OData syntax to get all the details ordered by the same like you saw for tables. It's, I don't have to believe the point. GraphQL, same thing. I'm just referencing the name of the view in my, in my uh, post button to get all the book details, including, of course, the comma separated list. That's what's coming out of the view. Get a book detail by its ID, 1017. Just give me 1017. But this is from the view, of course. Get all book details sorted by page and titles. OK, now it gets even better with stored procedures. So I might have a stored procedure. That you know takes a parameter of what type of search I can do. It contains a search or it starts with search. And then the text to search and like the search that comma separate the search the list of authors you know wherever they lie in that comma separated list you know and it uses a similar string ag but you know i'm doing the aware clause here to to do to do the logic and now i'm gonna and then i run the store procedure four times starts with robert robert silvenberg robert silvenberg starts with asimov none because asimov is the last name it starts with Isaac, so I have to do a contains for Asimov to get Asimov, or contains for Hoffman to get Hoffman here, Anna Hoffman. So see these four examples, we're gonna see them now again in the Postman, following store procedures, here's my rest, here are the same four that we just saw. Here's, here are my store procedure parameters. Starts with Robert, we just did, uh, oops. I did, it looks like I didn't update my DAB configuration file. I got a little ahead of myself. I created the store procedure, but I have to call a DAB add, right? I'm adding a type is store procedure, and that's the name of the store procedure in the database. And here are my parameters, search type with a default, but it's search type and author are, are the parameters for the store procedure. Now I can dab start and should be able to run that endpoint. And there you see, there are the two that with the first name start, the name starts with Robert. Starts with Asimov, we saw we don't get any. We have to do a contains Asimov. See, I'm embedding the store procedure parameters in the URI. Now that can become a little unwieldy, right? If there's a lot of them. And, they, and if they're and if they're lengthy, we might want to do a post instead. Like here's a post. It just posts to the store procedure, and the parameters are in the body. And if we if it was a lot of parameters, it'd be much easier to manage them in the body of the request. But this will fail because we have to explicitly allow post. We only have, are allowing get. And here's a case where it's just going to be simpler to modify the configuration file by hand. Here's our get code book you know our store procedure mapping 
uh, than to use a dab update command. I want to allow get and post. Stop and restart the server. And now the post should work. And it does. GraphQL, pulling that stored procedure. Same thing, here are my parameters. Here are the same four examples. Um, don't need to believe the point. Starts with Asimov, then we don't get any. It has to be a contains with Asimov. And then we'll get that book and contains Hoffman. So um, I'm looking at the time. I, I'm thinking maybe another 15 minutes to cover security. I don't know that we'll get to Cosmos DB. You'll have to tell me, Mark. If uh, if we're cutting it too close on time, but um, there is a, a very important feature in SQL Server called row level security (RLS). If you're not familiar with it, you're about to discover it now. Because all of the um, you'll see soon that we can apply security at the um, at the endpoint level, but if that ever gets circumvented you know, there's no security. So SQL Server has a feature called um, row level security where you can lock this down at the database level. Actually, I'll show you exactly what I'm talking about. Oh, okay. No, I go, just going a little out of sequence. Before we jump into row level security, let's just talk about you know, general security. We're talking about, going to talk about simple authentication with static web apps meaning non-role based. We just need to distinguish between authenticated users and non-authenticated users. So I'm gonna go to my book entities here, my book entity here, where I'm allowing all actions, read, read and write to anonymous users. I, I wanna say, wait a second, you need to be authenticated. Only authenticated users will have full access to the book entity. Otherwise, if you're anonymous, then you should only have read access. Furthermore, you should only be able to see books uh, after the year 2000. Like you have to be logged in to see books earlier than 2000. And this is going to be applied at the API level. So it's not, you know, you'll see in a moment that that's just kind of gets that's baked in. Um, I'm going to go ahead and restart the server and go and try and read all books. Get all books. Here's the output from before. We're definitely seeing books prior to the year 2000 from earlier. Now, when I run the query, look. Fewer books, only the ones in the uh, um, after the year 2000. If you look at the uh, uh, at the, the statement that got generated in here, there it is. A data API builder baked it into the query to filter it out because I'm not authenticated. I'm anonymous at this time. That means I shouldn't be able to create books either. I can only read books later than the year 2000, and I can't create or update or delete books. So let's try to create a book succeeded the last time now i'm getting a 403 on the other hand if i'm authenticated and the easiest way to simulate this is by changing the provider from static web apps to simulator we start the service and try to read all books yeah, I'm back to seeing all the books is because I'm the simulator is is behaving as if I am authenticated using static web web Azure web apps and uh, like for instance if it's running in a container and you're authenticated uh, and uh, I should now be able to create that book and I can um, but of course it gets much more interesting with Azure AD with Azure AD you can define roles and fine level permissions it's not just whether you're authenticated or not but once you are authenticated what roles are you assigned to which in turn defines what permissions you have so let me change simulator to Azure AD 
and add this little extra piece beneath it. This is my directory ID, my tenant ID in Azure AD, starts with D0, and this is the application ID. That's the audience, that's the application ID that I've defined. Okay, and the book permissions now, I'm going to change from the two that we had before for authenticated and anonymous to simply be book.reader and book.librarian. So basically, these are fine grained roles. I could have many more roles. If you're in the book reader role, you can read. If you're in the book librarian role, you can read and write, is all I'm saying here. And just to show you really quickly how this is configured in Azure AD. I've got this DAB library, Azure Active Directory. There's my tenant ID starting with D0. If I go to app registrations, there's my one application I defined for this demo called Data API Builder. It begins with EB, so those are those two IDs. If I click expose an API, oops, sorry, fill in one more level, expose an API. You can see there's a scope that essentially begins, that, that essentially is our client ID with endpoint access. That's the scope that we want to expose. And Going back one more time to look at the enterprise applications and looking at users and groups for the Data API Builder demo. There's Jim Librarian and Joe Reader. Those are two Azure AD identities, but Jim Librarian is in the book librarian's role. Joe Reader is in the book reader's role. So that's all the setup. I mean, it's, it's a bit of elaborate setup with Azure AD if you haven't done that before. Uh, but it's it's it, it is actually you know pretty straightforward once it's all up and running. So what I'm going to do now is um, I'm going to log in as Joe Reader using the Azure CLI. So yeah, I've logged in. So once I'm logged in, I can get a token, an access token, a bearer token, if you will. There it is, grab that token, copy that, oops. And if you decode the token, you will see the roles that are in there, book.reader, not book.librarian, and you'll see the user, Joe Reader. If I go back on to Postman, and I try to get all books. Oh, uh, Oh, maybe I should restart the Azure CLI if I didn't. Okay, I'm getting a 403 now. Why? Well, you know why, I'm not authenticated. So I'm gonna go into headers here, and for authorization, I'm gonna plug in that bearer token and the role that, and I can't just put any role in there. I, it has to be a role that's in the array. And you know, there's only one ro role in the array and that's put that reader. Does that work? Yes, that works. But I shouldn't be able to create a book, right? So if I go to create a book, un not authenticated definitely fails. But if I authenticate with the bearer token for, for, for the reader, not the non-admin, if you will, It needs to be book librarian. I only have book.reader in that array. Still getting a 403. I can try it with book.librarian. It's not going to work because it's not in the JWT token. It still fails with the four. You don't get a body, but look, the status is still 403. Okay. On the other hand, now, if I log in as Jim Librarian, who's in the librarian role. So we'll do an AZ log out. Let's log back in again. 
this time as gym librarian. Get an at get an uh, get a bearer token. Decode that. Yeah, this is Jim Librarian. Look at his roles. Book.librarian. So for reading a book, certainly this will work. Let's put in the bearer token now for Jim Librarian. And this needs to be in the array. So we have to change that to librarian. Yep, it works. But what about creating a book? We tried book.librarian with the wrong bearer token before. It didn't work. With the right bearer token, one that has book.librarian in the array of roles, it succeeded. It created the book. And that is Azure AD. So um, it's becoming apparent to me that we're not going to have a chance to cover the NoSQL side of this, the Cosmos CD side of this. I would like to wrap it up if we have another five or six minutes available to cover the row level security support. That would be great. Uh, and don't, don't feel rushed. Yep. Oh, sure. Uh, no worries. I mean, uh, the, the, the interesting, I mean, I, I'll, I'll talk briefly to the Cosmos DB side of things since we won't have time for the demos uh, when we get to the end. But let me just finish up with row level security. You saw that with um, this configuration earlier. This one here. I am that you're greater than two equal to 2000. That is a security at the endpoint level. The databases may have actually baked in row level security, security at the table or the database level that is filtering data out. And in order to function, it needs to know who the user is. It needs context to the session. It needs to know who the middle tier has authenticated the user as. And it stores that in a, a very in a session context dictionary. OK, uh, that's the way row level security works. I'm going to give you kind of a crash course in it uh, right now in, in the next few minutes, looking at row level security. I'm going to create a branch table for different branches, different library branches. And I've got six of them, but notice that I'm naming the manager. So if you're logged in as Jim Librarian, you should only have access to this row and this row and this row, because this one's for Sam and this one's for Jane. These are, these are for Jane. So every each of these librarians, when they log in, they can only see the branches that they manage. They have access to none of the other branches. This That's the way role level security works. You create a predicate function with the logic that is basically saying there's a parameter that's going to get mapped to that column that has the username, this column here. So this username parameter is going to get mapped to this manager name column in a moment. You'll see that in a moment. And for every row in that table, a SQL Server is going to enforce this and say that the user that's running the query, which is stored in session context as preferred username, that will have to be set as the authenticated user, matches the username parameter, which right here we are mapping to the manager name, right? This is the, the name of the function. It takes a single parameter called username and it's being mapped to the manager name property of the branch table. The filter predicate for selects and updates and deletes and a block predicate for inserts and updates to make sure that you can't create, you know, I can create a new branch for myself but not for another librarian. Um, so I did this part already. Uh, Okay, I populated the six rows. Uh, did I create the predicate? <laughs> I forgot what I'm up to. Yeah, I had. Did I create the policy? No, I hadn't. Okay, now I created the policy, and now it's in effect. Now the policy is in effect. Select start. The table looks empty. There's no where clause. Select count returns zero because I have to call SP set session context to set the preferred username to, well, let's say it's Jim Librarian. That's the middle tier doing this. Assuming you've been authenticated as Jim Librarian, it gets shoved into session context. And now I just see the three rows of the table. Even though there's six rows in the table, I only see the three, even though there's no where clause here. Joe Reader, 
this time I'll set read only to true, which is what happens internally because you never, you really don't want to be able to change, <laughs> impersonate one user to another so easily. So you want to be able to store that session in a context value and in read only. I only see now Joe, read, and there are no none for Joe Reader. Joe Reader doesn't have any. And I can't set the session context again because it's been set for read only. And here's a store procedure that retrieves several values that would be found in the JWT token, including the preferred username that we're relying on. And right now you can see, I, because that's the last one I set for read only. So the data API builder is gonna set all of these. And that way, uh, and this is the one that is needed for row level security, and that way that should just work. Okay, so with that in place, uh, let me switch over to Postman and queue up the last round of demos for tonight. Let's try and get all branches. Oh, well, it would help if I updated my data, uh, data API builder configuration file, right? To add the branch table and expose it. Um, as well as uh, the, 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 um, the second store procedure, get session context values just for testing so we can see the values of the JWT token getting shoved into SQL Server's session context. Now we can dab start that up and run that again. Yeah, I get an empty array because there's no session context. Let's call the store procedure. Yeah. Nothing set. So let's go back to get, uh, let's go to the headers and in the authorization header, plug in the bearer token. This is a gym librarian. If it doesn't work, I'm not going to. I'm not going to. I'm not going to worry about it. It's just something that went fluky in the demo, and I kind of just try to shoehorn that in toward the end. So there's uh, what is the issue with role level? C oh, wait a second. Yeah, why? Why am I not? Oh yeah, one last thing. One last thing. See if you rush. That's when. That's when you mess up. That's. Stop the data API builder and guess what? That has to be set to true. Session context has to be set to true. That's more like it. There, the, the JWT token was unpacked. So now if I call get all branches, plugging in that same bearer token, instead of getting an empty array, I should get that. Just the rows for how who I'm authenticated as, which is the branches for Jim Librarian. Yeah, there we are. And even though there's more, you know, there's no way to circumvent this. It's not the uh, Data API Builder that's enforcing this filtering, but the Data API Builder is passing on the credentials from the JWT token into session context for SQL Server's role level security to kick in. And what about creating a branch? Well, I want to create a new branch called the new branch and if i try it will it will fail there's a block predicate blocking uh the operation uh that's because i don't have my authentic authorization set plug in the bearer token try it again it still fails well because i'm logged in as jim librarian i cannot create a branch for jane librarian if i try to create a branch for jim librarian that I'm going to manage and I'm logged in as Jim librarian that succeeds and now getting all branches shows not three branches but four branches including the new one I just added for Jim librarian giving me giving me my own kind of like siloed a view of the table as enforced by role level security so yeah um I think that took more time than I anticipated because I thought I would be able to get to the Cosmos DB side of things um we don't have time for that 
you can see I have got some endpoints. Um, the, the thing about Cosmos DB is it's non-relational. There are no joins. So GraphQL is not going to join documents in separate, in contain, you know, whether it's in the same container or separate containers for you. It's not going to happen. Cosmos DB doesn't work that way. So these examples all work with a denormalized representation of the book author's example, where I have denormalized some author information into the books entities uh, in, the, in, in various containers. And these endpoints, we're going to demonstrate that. But we are out of time, and uh, it's late, especially for those of us that might be on the East Coast. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it back over to you, Mark, and say thank you for inviting me. And I hope you all, all enjoyed the presentation and found it useful information. Thank you very much, uh, Lenny, and uh, I know it's late where you are, and uh, thank you to the rest of you who happened to join uh, an, at an earlier time than we normally meet. So uh, really appreci appreciate the presentation, interesting technology that you're working with here. And um, it's hot off the presses. And if it's there brand are- new, so it's I, something I to see, look at. Uh, Many thanks coming through on the chat and uh, really greatly appreciate it. Thank you, everyone. Have a great night. And uh, Lenny, I will I will follow up with you separately. Yeah. Fantastic. Uh, see, you. see you in Seattle or Bogota. <laughs> or both. Or both. How about, how about San Francisco? Sure. I'll, I'm there. OK. All right. All right. Thank you, everyone. Good night. <laughs>